I would invite you to turn in your Old Testament scriptures. Leviticus 19 is our main text for today. As we continue to deal with the subject of law, so I've chosen this text. I would invite you to stand for the reading now of God's word. Leviticus 19. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols, nor make for yourselves molded gods. I am the Lord your God. And if you offer a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it of it your own free will. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it and on the next day. And if any remains until the third day, it shall be burned in the fire. And if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity because he has profaned the hallowed offering of the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from his people. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, and you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you glean every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal nor, dear, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another, and you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. You shall not sow your field with mixed seed, nor shall a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. Whoever lies carnally with a woman who is betrothed to a man as a concubine and who has not at all been redeemed, nor given her freedom. For this there shall be scourging, but they shall not be put to death, because she was not free. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord, to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, a ram as a trespass offering. The priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before the Lord for his sin which he has committed, and the sin which he has committed shall be forgiven him. When you come into the land and have planted all kinds of trees for food, then you shall count their fruit as uncircumcised. Three years it shall be as uncircumcised to you. It shall not be eaten, but in the fourth year all its fruit shall be holy, a praise to the Lord. And in the fifth year you may eat its fruit, that it may yield to you its increase. I am the Lord your God. You shall not eat anything with blood, with the blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. You shall not shave around the sides of your head, nor shall you disfigure the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. Do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to be a harlot, lest the land fall into harlotry and the land become full of wickedness. 
You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God. I am the Lord. And if a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You shall do no injustice in judgment, in measurement of length, weight, or volume. You shall have honest scales, honest weights, an honest ephah, and an honest hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them. I am the Lord. Our New Testament reading, Romans 13. Romans 13 and verses 8 through 14. Here we read, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Amen. You may be seated. The last two Sundays, we have looked at the nature of law. Two weeks ago, the challenge was that we must stand in terms of both God's law and gospel. That's the witness, the message we bring, both God's law and gospel. Last week, we looked at the religious nature of law, and I have again included those five points that we discussed last week. Today, we are giving greater attention to God's law, the nature of God's law as we complete this brief series on law following the Westminster Confession of Faith. So today, the nature of God's law, I ask a question, are we inconsistent if we stand against gay mirage but eat a pulled pork sandwich? Question we can ask. Are you a hypocrite if you stand against other legalized perversions of other sorts, but if you're a man, you shave your beard? Are you inconsistent in these things? So guided in part by some of the points from the Westminster Confession of Faith, we're going to look at one of the fascinating chapters of law that God gave to Israel, Leviticus 19, as we consider the nature of law, the nature of God's law and its relevance, its application still for today. So here the, the thrust of my message, that in trust and faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, we still delight in God's law. We grieve when it is mocked, and ignored by ourselves and by others. So we're going to look first at Leviticus 19. And one of the great challenges, and as we look at Leviticus 19, we have not studied its context or anything. One of the challenges, any times we look at the Old Testament, is we often do not know the Old Testament scriptures as well as we should. And there is an order, a beauty to the Old Testament scriptures, all of scripture, but there is a beauty to the arrangement and the order of the Old Testament that can be difficult to grasp that we often miss. And so one of the books I would recommend 
a book that I turn to, not all the time, but um, occasionally. It's called The Literary Structure of the Old Testament. And it's an entire commentary on the Old Testament, not going verse by verse, but helping us see the big picture, helping us see the outline and the beauty, the symmetry of the Old Testament. If you would turn in your Bibles to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. One of the things we note, especially in the Pentateuch, are the time stamps that are given in some of these accounts. So, for example, Exodus 19, look at verses 1 and 2. We read, in the third month, you might want to underline that in your Bibles, in the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. So they leave Egypt, and by the third month, they now arrive in the wilderness of Sinai, that is before Mount Sinai. Then if you would turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10, just two verses from this chapter. Verses 11 and 12. And here we read, Now it came to pass on the twentieth day of the second month, in the second year. Again, you might want to underline that in your Bibles. Now it's the twentieth day of the second month, in the second year, that the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle of the testimony, and the children of Israel set out from the wilderness of Sinai on their journeys... Then the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So everything from Exodus 19.3 up through Numbers 10 and verse 10 took place or was revealed during that one year, that one year when the children of Israel stayed in the wilderness of Sinai. And so that is all one section, a very important section. It is God's covenant with Israel at Sinai. Now the rest of The Old Testament scriptures show what that means, but that is the giving of God's covenant with Israel at Sinai, Exodus 19 through Numbers chapter 10. And and David Dorsey sees seven sections, and I think he's probably correct on seeing these, seven major sections in this material. First, the giving of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 19 and 20. Then following that, you have various judicial laws that God gave to Israel, starting also in Exodus 20 through chapter 24. Then you have two sections, two long sections. First, the instruction for building the tabernacle. The instructions for building the tabernacle, Exodus 24 through near the end of chapter 34. Then the building of the tabernacle follows that, the end of Exodus 34 to the end of chapter 40. Then as you turn to the book of Leviticus, It begins with ten chapters relating to sacrifice and the dedication of the priesthood. Then, starting in chapter 11 through chapter 18, what you can call purity laws, and we would call them laws related to holiness. Some would say related to purity. Then chapter 19, 1, our chapter for today, through Numbers 10 and verse 10, the holiness laws, the holiness laws. And It's interesting to observe that in the six sections that contain the law given to Israel, that each section increases in length. So, for example, Exodus 19 and 20, just take up a page or two in the Hebrew Bible, but the holiness laws, Leviticus 19 through Numbers 10, about 39 pages in length. So there's an increase in length. Now, if you are aware of the start of the book of Numbers, there are censuses, census material at the start of Numbers. You say, how is that law? How is that part of law? Why would you include that under holiness? It seems strange. Well, there actually is an argument you can make. Because why is, or why is there that census for the children of Israel? It is related to the service of the priests. It's related to the holiness of the people. They need to know how many children of Israel there are Because there needs to be atonement. And remember, the Levites are set apart as the firstborn of Israel in their service. So even some of these sections of Scripture that we don't often consider as our meditation, the number of people in this tribe and that tribe, it is still part 
of the holiness that God had for his people. Now also what we observe, and maybe you noted this as we read from Leviticus 19, you see how there is that clear connection with the Ten Commandments. That's the first section of the law. It's repeated starting in Leviticus 19 and other portions of Scripture that follow. And as, at least as I did some study on Leviticus 19, I found at least nine of the commandments. Nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated just in Leviticus 19. The only commandment that I perhaps cannot see a clear connection with is thou shalt not covet. But maybe that is expressed in other ways. But at least nine of the commandments very clearly repeated in Leviticus 19 and then in the following chapters. Now if you would turn back to Leviticus 19, why is this section called the holiness code? Why is this section of Leviticus and following called the Holiness Code? Well, several reasons. First, verse 2. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so the word holy, starting with this verse, starting with this chapter, appears quite a few times Then in following chapters, this is all part of God's holiness that he calls for his people. And isn't it an amazing thing to consider? We consider the holiness of God. That's an awesome thing to consider, that we are called to be holy. Here is this rebellious nation that worshipped idols, that had all sorts of problems. They are called to be holy. And the same thing is true today. God delivers his people, he saves us, he calls us to walk in holiness. For we know this command of holiness is not just an Old Testament thing, is it? There were particular expressions, we might say peculiar to the Old Testament, but all throughout the New Testament don't we see that same command to live holy lives. Romans 12, 1, your entire life is to be what? A living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God. That is your reasonable service. Do you see how Paul in Romans and in other parts is constantly borrowing from themes in the Old Testament scriptures? 1 Corinthians 3.17, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Ephesians 1.4, just as he chose us in him, Why? He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy, without blame before him in love. And then Peter directly cites Leviticus 19.2, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Why? Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So the call of holiness is not just an Old Testament command, is it? Now, one of the challenges that believers face and unbelievers frequently use against us is when you read Leviticus 19, you find quite a variety of laws all placed together. I mean, look at all the different commands. Now, my count is not infallible, but I count at least 36 commandments or related commandments in this chapter. And they fall into a variety of categories, don't they? It almost seems like it jumps around. I don't believe it does. I think there's a reason for the order. I'm not going to try to present that here. But when we look at these commandments, I would say most of them are connected with the moral law, what we call the moral law. A few are judicial in nature, I would argue. And then a few more are ceremonial. But again, as you observe Leviticus 19, all the laws are given together. They're not divided up into separate sections. You do see different groupings, but they're all just put together. That's how God gives his law. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, are you inconsistent? Are you a hypocrite if you stand against open marriage? You stand against polyamory, but you shave your sideburns. If you have a beard, are you violating God's law when you shave the sides of your beard? Look at another commandment. It's an interesting one. If you plant a fruit tree, and this was obviously given to Israel as they were about to enter the land, for the first three years you were not to eat any of that fruit from that new fruit tree. So are you a hypocrite if you plant an apple tree and you eat some of that fruit? 
that first comes from the tree. And Christians have given different suggestions for how we handle these questions. Some Christians say, well, the entire law just stands together. If we are free from any part of the law, we're free from the entire law. I think that's a very dangerous position to hold. And yes, we do recognize the unity of the law. This was all given as part of God's covenant. God's people didn't have to just divide it up. They were to keep all of it. But this doesn't mean that we cannot draw any distinctions. In fact, anytime we read the Bible, we are aware of the big pattern, as it were, but we also try to make distinctions. When you read the book of Romans, do you keep in mind those passages, for example, that deal with justification and those passages that deal with sanctification? Do you find Paul in the book of Romans saying, well, now listen up, I'm going to talk about justification in these next 15 verses. Then in the next chapter, I'm going to move on to sanctification. You don't find that, at least in the inspired word. Maybe your study Bible helps you divide up the word that way. The word of God comes to us as one word. We have to pay attention. We make distinctions as we read. What if someone quoted to you Romans 6.12? Romans 6.12, which says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And what if that person asked you, do you lust anymore? Well, if you're honest, you say, yes, I I still do have some lusts. They would say, well, you're not saved then. Because the Word of God says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey in its lusts. If you have any lust in your life, you cannot be a Christian. How would you respond to that person? You'd say, well, you're misreading God's Word. You're misunderstanding what the book of Romans says. And what other parts of Scripture say about salvation, salvation is always by grace through faith alone. And yes, now we understand that believers are called to live lives of holiness. That is part of our sanctification. So anytime we read Scripture, we are aware of the unity of Scripture, but we have to make appropriate distinctions. And I think the same thing is true when we study Old Testament law. There are challenges, no doubt, but we seek to understand those portions of the law that we call moral, those portions that we call ceremonial and judicial. Here's how the Westminster Confession of Faith deals with these three sections. I've quoted some of these sections for you. Let's look at 19.3. Besides this law that is the moral law, commonly called moral, God was pleased to give to the people of Israel as a church under age ceremonial laws containing several typical ordinances, Partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits. Partly holding forth diverse instructions of moral duties, all which ceremonial laws are now abrogated under the New Testament. And then 19.4. To them also as a body politic, he gave sundry judicial laws which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging under any now further than the general equity thereof may require. And that last section there of 19.4 is a very rich section, somewhat controversial also. Now, on what basis do we say, well, this is moral, this is ceremonial, this is judicial? Who has the right to do that? Well, it simply cannot be we just flip a die or a coin or we just pick and choose. We have to look to Scripture as much as possible. We have to look to what Scripture says about these matters, both the Old and New Testament Scriptures. That's the way we seek to understand. Because here's what we can say. Only scriptural authority is sufficient to alter the observance of any law of God. Only the authority of Scripture Let's look at a few examples. We begin with that which is, you might say, the easiest. The laws related to sacrifice. Two weeks ago, we looked at Hebrews 9. Turn there, if you would, again. Hebrews 9, speaking of the service of the tabernacle, the temple. And what does the writer of Hebrews say about the earthly sanctuary We read this, verses 9 and 10. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. 
So the New Testament says these things were for a time. In the New Testament, we further see that other aspects of the ceremonial law, laws related to food and drink also have been fulfilled in Christ. So Paul in 1 Timothy 4, he talks about those who make commandments about abstaining from food, which Paul says God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Paul says further in 1 Timothy 4, for every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Another clear passage would be Colossians 2.16. Colossians 2.16, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. The word Sabbath there in the plural. So here's I think, a response we give to the unbeliever who challenges us. Maybe it's even another Christian. We would say this, with respect to which laws from the Old Testament are still applicable, still in force, our best response would be to say they have all an application unless we can show from Scripture how that particular law, that series of laws are fulfilled in Christ, that they no longer have the same binding application as they did before. Now, our Christians inconsistent in this. Of course they are. Of course, as Christians, we are not always consistent. We sometimes do look at the world and judge the world when we are guilty of the same sin. But does this mean we get rid of the problem by just throwing out the standard? Obviously not. Inconsistency on the part of Christians does not change what God has revealed. Failure to do God's will does not mean we throw away God's will. We may not be able to answer every question with ease. You may be stumbled or not be able to answer a a very difficult question an unbeliever might ask you. There are ways to, to get these answers. But let us, again, seek to delight in God's law, to be grieved when it is ignored, when it is mocked either by ourselves or by others. Well, let's consider... A little more, the place still of the law for the believer. I've quoted, again, in your bulletins from the Westminster Confession of Faith, section 19.6, a longer section. Although true believers be not under the law as a covenant of works, to be thereby justified or condemned, yet it is of great use to them as well as to others, in that as a rule of life, informing them of the will of God and their duty, it directs and binds them to walk accordingly, discovering also the sinful pollutions of their nature, hearts, and lives. So as examining themselves thereby, they may come to further conviction of humiliation for and hatred against sin, together with a clearer sight of the need they have of Christ and the perfection of his obedience. I'm going to end there. For the individual believer, there is still a very important part For God's law. Leviticus 19, then we can say, is part of the rule of life for the believer to inform you of your sinfulness, to inform you of God's will, to show you again how we need the perfection and obedience of Christ. Let's consider just a few points here from Leviticus 19, not exhaustive by any means, but one of the things this passage reminds us of is the lordship of God over every part of life. Did you notice when we read this passage how many times it says, or it talks about the Lord? I am the Lord your God. Different variants of that. It almost divides the chapter into different sections. That repetition of the lordship of Christ. Because what is it, what is so easy for us to do? We proclaim the lordship of Christ in this place. We proclaim the lordship of Christ everywhere, but we can limit that lordship. We want to leave space, don't we, for our own life. This is, this is going to be my place. And so Leviticus 19 and, and other passages, of course, remind us you cannot limit the lordship of Jesus Christ. We see the call for children and adults that we live a life of respect especially for those who are older. Look at verses 3 and 32 from Leviticus 19. A life 
of respect for others, especially for those who are older. And then also from verse 3, isn't it interesting how in verse 3 there is that connection between giving proper reverence to one's parents, honoring one's mother and father, and tied with that is the keeping of God's Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. I think passages like Leviticus 19 are given also to help us reflect on all the different connections that God's law calls us to make, to observe about life, the order of life. In this case, the connection between honoring our parents, giving honor to whom honor is due, and honoring God's order of our lives. As the nation of Israel, there was not just the one Sabbath day. There were a series of Sabbath days. They didn't always want to keep those days. They wanted to do what they wanted to do, just as we are tempted to do whatever we want to do. Now, we recognize there is a change in terms of the Sabbath laws in their plural, but here's an interesting connection. There are many parents who certainly want their children to honor them. That's right and proper, and yet these parents have very little time for God. They demand honor from their children, but how much honor do these same parents give to God's rule and sovereignty over their lives. We might say this is the height of hypocrisy to demand honor from others when we do not honor God as he orders. We can make other applications here. We look at some of the ceremonial laws related to the peace offerings. We understand here in verses 5 through 8, we don't offer peace offerings any longer. That's part of the ceremonial laws that have been fulfilled in Christ. We may say there's application, though, we make from it, that we cannot worship God on our own terms. We must worship and serve God as he commands. We look at verses 9 and 10. The duty that we show to the poor how? By giving them meaningful ways to care for themselves, not through handouts, but through meaningful labor. We think of verse 9, how important that is to the coming of Christ. How? If you've read the book of Ruth, you see the laws about gleaning and how that brings together the Moabitess, Ruth, with Boaz. So we can say even this law seems trivial. Yes, it deals with the poor, but it is part of God's way for the bringing forth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verses 33 and 34 also certainly have application, helping those who come into a land, giving help to the stranger. Verse 14, also a very interesting verse. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God, I am the Lord. Now, did people literally put stumbling blocks before the blind? I don't know if we have enough to know that, but we can say it's certainly there's a way to take advantage of people that can be very cruel and mean, and the Lord commands kindness to those, we might say, who are vulnerable. Now, we know law cannot change your heart. Law can never change a person's heart. It has no power to change your feelings in its own, but law does set forth actions and attitudes. Notice the law is not just external. It commands also internal actions, which only can be fulfilled, we know, by the grace of God. But notice how this passage has great application for how we treat each other. Look at verse 11. You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. Look at verses 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Then notice the next line. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor, not bear sin because of him. Do you notice New Testament passages that come to mind as you read that verse? Think of Galatians about going to that one who may be in sin. Verse 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is quoted by Paul in the book of Romans, Romans 13. We also observe the principle of godly separation. The principle of godly separation from paganism and the evil in this world. I I mentioned last week, we know that as Christians, sometimes we are guilty of making all sorts of man-made rules. 
We have our own man-made laws, maybe partially based in Scripture, but a lot of it just based on our own feelings and perceptions. Now, it's one thing for parents to make those rules for their own children. It's another thing when I make a man-made law and I expect you to follow it. There's a, a danger in that. We recognize that danger. But sadly, Christians often want to do what? Yes, we're not going to follow man-made rules, but we're going to mimic the world as closely as possible. We're naive concerning the values and principles of the world. God calls his people have nothing to do with this paganism. So much paganism that I think naive Christians bring in. So yes, we don't want to follow man-made rules, but are we sincere before the Lord in following him? Well, there's so much more we could consider from this passage. I think one of the verses that calls us to reflect on passages like this is Paul's command to Timothy or his reminder to Timothy. All scripture, he says, is God-breathed, given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Passages like Leviticus 19 are given for your thought. They are profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? So that we may be prepared for every good work. And so we recognize the value of God's law. Yes, we distinguish those portions that have applicability directly, those that have been fulfilled in Christ. We value God's law. We delight in it. We grieve when it is ignored and mocked. We've been going through Psalm 119, and that psalmist frequently expresses his grief when he sees the word of God ignored, not just by the pagan Philistines, no, but by those of his own community. The rivers of tears which came from his eyes because God's law was not honored. I would invite you to turn to a final passage from Romans 13. We looked at a portion of this passage. Matt, in his Bible study at the nursing home, has been going through this portion of the book of Romans. And I think we can notice a connection, well, certainly a connection, with this portion of Romans and even a passage like Leviticus 19. What's the call of Romans 13 in light of Leviticus 19. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. That is the, the return of Christ. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So we have Leviticus 19, and we know how can we ever do that? It's only as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way we will keep the law of God. How thankful we are then for the forgiveness of sins. Because if we're honest before the Lord, we know there is something in that listing that we read from Leviticus 19 or in certainly another passage where we have been guilty. So again, the message we bring to the world is not we are perfect. The message we bring to the world is we have a perfect standard. And we have the perfect Savior. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In putting on the Lord Jesus Christ then, we make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And so we delight in the law of God. We grieve when it is ignored or mocked. So for his name, for his glory alone, we pray. And let us pray now. Heavenly Father, thank you for these brief moments to spend in your word, in your worship. Let us, as we have been called to do from 2 
Timothy 3. Let us continue to give attention to all of Scripture, knowing its profit, knowing its use. And, O oh Lord, help us to stand in a very dark and difficult age where we see your truth so despised, so compromised. And, Lord, again, deliver us where we are guilty, where we are inconsistent. And, Lord, let us be strengthened to bring this faithful witness of your law and of your gospel. And we ask this for the glory that belongs to you alone, rejoicing in the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that it is his kingdom that will prevail and triumph over all kingdoms of man. And so we do not grow weary or discouraged, for we do know that our Lord does reign over all nations. And we pray that you would continue then to strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen.